doing uh, each chunk of, of scripture in the book of Hosea as a professional reading. Um, the, the text of, of that um, as being a, a redeemed uh, life, or a bought and redeemed from sin, and putting on uh, clean garments um, as uh, just really um, made me think of this song. And so uh, I'll read you the first uh, verse, and then uh, we'll sing it as a new way of introducing it to you guys for this Sunday morning. Wake up, O God, of Zion. Leave here your clothing of shame. No more the orphan or harlot. See, I give you a new name. Take up these garments of splendor. Beautiful daughter, rise up. Feel my great mercy surround you. Dress in the gown of my love. The centerpiece of our talk tonight will uh, revolve around Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. So that might be a good place to put your bookmark or your finger. 
We're in the middle of a study on covenant theology. And I'm glad that uh, there's some level of interest in this. Maybe it's because we, as a church, don't really talk about it that much or we haven't talked about it all that much. But uh, I've heard comments from several of you say, this is really interesting and I'm, I'm glad that it is because it's the way that God has revealed himself to mankind. So we're drawing from a book written by a Baptist in 1681 named Nehemiah Cox. The name of the book is called Covenant Theology from Adam to Christ. And what he does is he takes the covenants uh, in the Bible from Adam to Christ and he just explains how they relate to each other and what God is, is trying to communicate to us through those. Uh, the first one that's revealed in real time is the covenant of works, which is what we will focus on tonight. I say real time because the first covenant of all time was in eternity past called the eternal covenant or the covenant of redemption. And that was a covenant made among the persons of the Trinity before time existed. But in real time, and actually the first one we encounter in Scripture is the covenant of works with Adam. Adam acted as a representative or a federal head for all mankind that was yet stored up in his loins. And when Adam broke this covenant that we'll talk about, all of those who were yet in his loins fell with him. He was their representative or the federal head. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Death passed into Adam and then from Adam into his seed after him so that all men now die. And we'll explore three areas tonight. I'll try to, to be brief. I know I can get long-winded sometimes, but we're going to just focus tonight on God's transaction with Adam, a covenant of works. Secondly, on Adam's position as mankind's federal head. And then third, the state and condition of fallen man thereafter. So the covenant of works, and I'm, I'm following Nehemiah Cox, the way he's arranged his material. I would have arranged it a little bit differently if it were me, but he's much smarter than I am, so we'll go with Nehemiah. But we should state from the outset something that he didn't state, but I'll state it. Adam enjoyed two wonderful advantages in this covenant. One was that God created Adam very good. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. Adam uh, did not, was not contaminated by sin. When he was created, he was created very good and not bad at all. Second advantage is God placed Adam in a perfect environment. So he was very good, he was in a perfect environment, God gave him everything he could possibly give him to succeed in this covenant of works. Uh, not only that, but God created Adam in God's image and in his likeness. Genesis 1 verse 26. These are words that are not unfamiliar to you. We're all made in God's image. That means that we are image bearers of the true and living God. This refers to the moral image of God. And when we think about it, God has wisdom. God has a heart with affections. God has a rational reasoning capability. And God has a will by which he makes choices a perfectly free will, I might add, by which he makes choices. And when he created Adam, he imbibed Adam with all of those attributes, maybe not to the level of God, but man is separated from the lower creatures of the earth in that he, he has wisdom, he has a heart that has affections, he has uh, rational reasoning capabilities, and with regard to Adam, he had a perfect free will. Cox summarizes it this way, under this covenant, man was left to the freedom of his own will. And so shortly after creating Adam, God graciously entered into the covenant, and here it is, 
Genesis 2, verse 16. Very simple. All of us can understand it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now let's, let's just read that again because the rest of the Bible really is predicated upon this promise, this uh, covenant of works. The Lord God commanded the man saying, you may eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Very simple, very easy. A child could understand that command. But when we look at it, it really has two elements. It has a promise of reward, and that is Nehemiah Cox's language, not mine. Uh, and also a warning of punishment. The promise of reward was to walk with God. You can eat of every tree and walk with me. But you eat of one tree and you have no fellowship. In fact, you die. And then the warning of punishment. Well, the promise of reward also, you had the sovereign bounty and goodness of God. You, you had everything that was given to you. So not only did you have God, which is enough, but you had everything that God had created for your own benefit. The warning of punishment was death, not only physical death, but eternal death. So that was the covenant, the covenant of works. Simple, if Adam had kept it, we would all be living wonderfully, but Adam didn't keep it. Before we get to the effects of it, let's move to the second point. Adam acted as mankind's federal head. We talked about this last week, that the way God has chosen to convey these covenants is to a, a leader or a representative who is representative of a larger body of people. And in this case, God graciously chose to reveal his covenant to a federal representative of all mankind, Adam. And I say graciously because Adam was created very good and Adam was placed in a perfect environment. You and I weren't. And if Adam couldn't succeed under those conditions, there's no possibility that we can succeed under ours. But the federal nature of the covenant is implicit throughout Genesis. You say, well, I'm not convinced that Adam acted as a federal head and just because Adam sinned, that was imputed to me. Why am I responsible for what Adam did? Well, let me, let me justify this a little bit from Scripture. The federal nature is implicit through Genesis as we see Adam's sin spreading to his own sons and then to all of his descendants. Genesis 6, verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's Genesis 6, but right after Adam disobeyed, his sons, Cain and Abel, Cain murdered Abel, his son, for really no apparent reason other than jealousy or pride. It wasn't like Abel punched him in the face and incited his anger or anything. He, he, he just had sin in his heart, and it came out by murdering his own brother. Well, that sin was in the heart of everyone born of Adam because Adam was a diseased creature and that disease passed on to all of them. That's implicit though. The New Testament states it explicitly in Romans 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. That fifth chapter of Romans goes on to present Jesus Christ as our new federal head of a new spiritual race. Indeed, the chapter compares the weakness of our first federal head, Adam, with the superiority of our new federal head, Jesus Christ. 
So we've got the covenant, we've got the leader or representative with whom that covenant was made, and now we move to the third area of consideration tonight, the state and condition of fallen man after the covenant. Adam's sin became our sin. I don't like that. There's something in me because I'm not blaming God, trust me. We just don't like to hear that because someone else sinned, we get the punishment. That just doesn't seem fair, but that's the reality. That's where we are. That's what the scripture tells us. And not only that, but we begin to see the curse and the depths of what Adam's sin imputed into us. By Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, Adam knew he stood guilty before God and he hid, is the term the Bible uses. God had to call him out of hiding. By Genesis 4, verse 8, we see the effects of sin as Adam's son, Cain, murders his own brother. By Genesis 4, verse 19, Adam's grandson, Lamech, commits polygamy. And by Genesis 6, verse 5, as we read, every thought of man's heart was only evil continually. And the New Testament begins to give some commentary on the depths of our sinfulness. It describes us like this, Adam and all mankind became dead in trespasses and sin. Ephesians 2 verse 1. Adam and all mankind became children of God's wrath. Ephesians 2 verse 3. Adam and all mankind became darkened in mind and reason. Romans chapter 1 verses 21 and 22. Adam and all mankind rebelled against God's created order. Romans 1 verse 24 and forward. Adam and all mankind lost their state of innocency. Romans 3 verse 10. Adam and all mankind became enslaved to our sinful condition. Romans chapter 6 verse 6. Adam and all mankind became instant enemies of God. Romans 11 verse 28. And it wasn't as if only man was affected. Even creation, our natural environment was cursed. And Romans 8 verse 20 says, it groans for its redemption too. So this unleashing of sin was massive in weight. Sadly, it gets even worse. I know you probably had a rough, long day today, and the last thing you want to do is hear bad news, but there's more bad news coming down the pike. Man's penalty for his ruined state is not only physical death, but it's death eternal. Nehemiah Cox frames it this way, the punishment has an infinity in its eternity because the fault is infinitely aggravated against an infinite God. What he's saying is one sin against an infinite God demands infinite punishment. I mean, this is really bad, what Adam did. All of this that I just mentioned is laid out for Adam in his state of innocency and in a perfect environment. It all could have been avoided. Yet, he disobeyed God's one command and brought ruination upon the entire human race in the process. So that's bad. Really bad. But that dark message sets the stage for God's glorious covenant of grace. Cox sums up 
Adam's failure this way. By the sin of man, the frame of the earth and the heavens made for his service and delight was loosed, and their foundations so shaken as would have issued in an utter ruin had not Christ interposed and upheld their pillars. And he cites a couple of verses we'll read in just a moment, but he goes on. If the curse had been immediately executed in its rigor with these desolations following, there was a hell prepared ready for man. And what he's saying is, but for Christ intervening once Adam bit the fruit, the whole structure of the universe would have fallen apart. Sun would have fallen out of the sky. Gravitational pulls would have been haywire. Hell would have ensued. The earth would have been scorched. Man would be burning and burning and burning and would be destroyed. Adam would have in the blink of an eye. But Christ interposed. And so what is occurring here is two things happened simultaneously when Adam fell. One is Christ intervened and upheld the universe from collapse. Psalm 75 verse 3 says, when the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who keep steady its pillars. And we might think that the I there is God, but the writer of Hebrews alludes that this is Christ. He says, He, Christ, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. The action of restraining grace was rooted in the eternal covenant before the heavens and earth were created. I know we're getting deep. But the reason God didn't execute Adam's death penalty immediately is because Christ intervened based upon the promise and the covenant that they had made in the eternal council before creation. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 and 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 um, alludes to that and we may do well to read that at the end. But that intra-Trinitarian covenant in eternity past contemplated Adam's nightmarish fall and made provisions for God to bring one from Adam's fallen race, namely Jesus Christ, to bring redemption to God's elect children. So thank God Christ intervened at that moment. And then the second thing that happened simultaneous with Adam's sin is God promised a covenant of grace which guaranteed both his faithfulness to his eternal covenant before there was time and its fulfillment in an offspring from Adam's ruined race, which Genesis 3 verse 16 prophesies. And so we'll look at these things more next week. But just a couple of verses and then... Uh, I'll close for tonight. After Adam fell and the curses are being doled out by God, he says in Genesis 3 verse 16 to the serpent, I will put, uh, actually it's verse three, fifth, chapter 3 verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her offspring and your offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. As the rest of the Old Testament and New Testament open up, we come back to this prophecy and we realize that the offspring is Christ and his people and Satan and his people. And so it is offspring singular, but he is the federal head who represents the offspring plural, you and I. And that's what the prophecy is indicating. The New Testament makes that plain. So we'll trace it out um, beginning next week. But I'd like to close with that eternal covenant just so that we have it fixed in our minds. What, what do you keep talking about? Covenant of redemption, eternal covenant. Well, before there was time, if you'll look at Titus chapter 1 verse 2. 
This verse indicates before there was time, there was a meeting amongst the, the three persons of the Trinity, and a covenant was made. Titus and 2 Timothy are two of the final letters that Paul wrote. And why God chose to reveal this at the very end of the New Testament, I don't know. I can't answer that question, but... Um, we do have this revelation, Titus chapter 1, verse 2, which says uh, that, that Paul, in verse 1, he's, he's thanking God, and he says, In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Now, before the ages began uh, is... I've got a little footnote here that says that the Greek literal is before times eternal. Or in other places it's translated before the foundation of the world. So we're talking about pre-Adam, pre-creation, in eternity past when only God existed. He promised eternal life and he never lies. So when that promise was made, it contemplated that Adam, who was created very good with a free will to exercise his choice in a perfect environment, would fail. And contemplating way back here that it would fail, Christ intervened at the point of failure. He withheld judgment. And as we see the New Testament play out, he came, he fulfilled the covenant of works for all those who would receive it by faith and all those who would receive his fulfilled covenant of works by faith are declared righteous before God. Just uh, to let you know, that's not a one-off verse and we're not building a whole uh, scheme off of one verse in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, Paul makes reference to the same eternal covenant. Here he's writing to Timothy. The only reason I can think that he gave this to, to Titus and to Timothy is because they both were pastors. And he felt like he could entrust this truth to them and they wouldn't run the wrong way with it or they wouldn't um, go off into false teaching with it, but that they would hold it responsibly. But he, he says uh, that God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Same phrase, times eternal, before the foundation of the world. So we know that he contemplated Adam's fall and he contemplated adopting a people for himself after Adam's fall. And we know that Christ contemplated that he would, become, would come into the earth as the new Adam, fulfill all that which Adam was unable to fulfill. And then as Adam's sin was imputed to us and we didn't like that idea, Christ's righteousness is imputed to us, and we like that idea. So as much as we don't like sin being counted toward us when we didn't really have anything to do with it, we love righteousness being imputed to us when we didn't have anything to do with it. So thank the Lord for th this federal theology concept, and thank the Lord Jesus for intervening and and um, taking action to make sure that a people would survive and be called God's people from Adam all the way until the last person comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'll stop at that point. I know this is deeply theological and um, we don't do that very often. Mainly we just stick with verses and work verse by verse, but there is, uh, there's a lot of good that comes out of understanding sound theology. So I'll stop at this point and ask, are there any questions or is anyone confused or uh, any comments that anyone might have?
last part it says, in fulfillment in an offspring, you said Christ and his people and Satan is his people. And I'm not sure I understand that. So is that going to carry on? Yeah. We'll, we'll pick up on that next week. And uh, Beverly's question for those on uh, Facebook Live, um, the difference between Christ and his offspring and Satan and his offspring, are we going to pick up on that next week and explore that a little bit more? And we will. Uh, but the effects, the short answer in case you're not here next week, uh, the effects of sin entering into Adam into the world system and into Adam's posterity are that every person born of woman is born a child of Satan. Jesus says it, you, and he's talking to the religious elites, you are of your father, the devil. And this is what God was referring to when he says, um, I'm going to put enmity between you, Eve, and the godly offspring, who will have Christ as their head, and you, serpent, and all of those who are born into this world and live in an ungodly way according to their natural inclinations, post-fall. And so that's, and in fact, when you read Genesis, as I was reading, um, you start to see this shape up. You see the godly line flowing through Abel, who was murdered, and then Seth, who God appointed to Eve to, to conceive again, and Seth. And then you follow Seth down to Noah, and we'll look at the Noahic covenant two weeks from tonight. And then Noah uh, flows down to Abraham, and then Abraham flows down to King David, and then Christ comes out of King David's lineage. And you follow the other ungodly seed, and you've got um, Cain and all these characters like Lamech who became a polygamist right off the bat. It's amazing the first two sins are murder and polygamy. It's sex and murder, same thing that sells today. And I fall for it. I watch, I'm, I'm a crime uh, affectionado. I watch all these crime, true crime. I love it. Why do I love murder? Well, it's not the murder. It's the solving of the murder that I love. I'm a Sherlock Holmes fan. But but it's the sin nature that makes that attractive to us, even. I like the redemption part, but you got to have murder for there to be the, the, the crime solved. But that flows all the way through um, uh, Ham, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, who were Noah's sons. And it goes all the way through an ungodly line, uh, and we see that beginning to take shape. So that's a good question, and we will explore that um, as we work through these covenants together. The, the question um, that I always have, that I've had and still have sometimes is, if Adam was created with this ability to choose good or to choose evil, came through when I was coming through church um, as a child and growing up that I have that same capacity. I've got a free will. I can choose good or I can choose evil. And there are some denominations that, that follow that path. Um, the Methodists would be one. As I read this, and then I read the Apostle Paul's commentary, specifically in Romans 3, I think when sin entered into man, it corrupted the whole of Adam. Even his ability, it affected his desires. It affected his ability to choose right from wrong. He became a enslaved to his inclinations, which now were informed by sin and proclivities rather than righteousness where it had been inclined before. And so uh, I began to read Paul in Romans 3. He talks about there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that seeketh after God. There is, there is none. All of us like sheep have gone astray. He, he talks about uh, we are like uh, poisonous snakes with venom under our tongues. 
Uh, he talks about how wicked and evil our uh, feet are. We're swift to do violence. He just goes through from feet to hands to mouth uh, to, to the whole person. And so um, I, I, began, I began to say, hmm, what does the Baptist faith and message say about this? And when you go to the statement in the Baptist faith and message on, on man, it says that he is a sinner by nature and by choice. And I said, okay, well, this is what Baptists today believe, that he's a sin he was born into sin and he chose to sin because he was born into a nature of sin. So it helped me to understand that sin is not... Um, A list of right and wrongs it, in part it is but sin is a disease it's who I am I I sin because I'm a sinner I didn't start out good and sinned and became a sinner I was born into this world a sinner and when I began to see that um, then that made Christ so beautiful because if, if Adam was my, my federal head and he imparted that to me at birth and I was born this way, Christ brought a much greater level of righteousness and he imparted that to me. And that's why now, uh, post-conversion, we do have this capacity uh, that, that has in part been restored. We have the righteous desires. We, we can choose God. We can choose to read our Bible rather than to watch uh, dirty material. Post-conversion, but pre-conversion, we chase after what our heart desires and our heart does not desire God. So uh, if, we, if, you're, if you understand that point, all of this becomes much easier. But if you struggle with that point, um, I did too. So... <laughs> I'm right there with you, and sometimes I still struggle with it. So don't be discouraged at all, and I certainly don't want anyone to think, um, okay, he knows everything. We're all still learning as we go. Uh, but that, that, to me, is what the scriptural data gives us, the biblical data, the biblical definition of sin and righteousness and judgment. Uh, leads us to that place. So, Joe, you're looking with a furrowed brow as if you're confused. Yeah, and we all, because that's the nature that we were born into, we all drift back to that place, don't we? Because I know I find myself saying, I didn't memorize a verse this week, which that's not my goal, but I tried that. I, I'm going to try to memorize one verse a week. That'd be 52 verses in a year, and I made it like one week. <laughs> And then I felt guilty, but what was I doing? I was imposing a, a works-based scheme when the way that God has, has ordered it, grace comes, changes the desires of the heart, and it's no longer works, it's joy. Yeah, so you were... <laughs> Seminary did some of this to us. We, there were certain assignments where we had to witness to at least one person a week during the course of the semester. And so I'd get down to, you know, Saturday night, and I knew Monday morning was coming, and I was like, well, I ain't gonna witness nobody at church. 
they're, they're presumably all saved. So, you know, I'd get out at 10 o'clock at night and, and go find somebody and witness to them so that I could check it off of the, the syllabus. And I'm part of my grade, I got to witness to people. Well, that was not the right motive, but that built into me something like you're talking about, Joe. Am I in sin if I don't witness to one person a week until I die? That's really only 52 people a year. And I hope I live, I'm not going to put a number because there's some people that might get offended by that. I hope I live 100 years. Nobody in here is 100, are they? I don't know, you quiet group. Some of you may be 100. Lessons get getting close. But yeah, we can all drift back into that works-based mindset because it's built into the sin part of our DNA. And, and that's, the, that's the point. It's grace. And then the grace really ought to cause us to do greater works than our guilty consciences would cause us to do. It ought to transform us so that we live all of our life. We're not having to look to people to witness. We just witness wherever we are, and it comes out of us. Any other comments? We'll look next week at, at the uh, covenant of grace. All the bad news was tonight. Got that over with. We'll, we'll look at more uh, positive and wonderful things next week. Well, the question is, was it Christ walking with Adam in the cool of the, the day or night? Um, maybe and maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> and no New Testament author confirms it. So perhaps. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. And, and we thank you so much that you did not leave us. Um, dead in sin under the covenant of works, much less destroy us, which was the due penalty. We thank you that Christ intervened. We thank you that one day we will see Adam, and though he failed us, even his failure paved the way for a new federal head, the Lord Jesus Christ to shine forth in glory and in righteousness. And so we look forward to glorying in that with Adam, with Eve, with Abel and Seth and Noah and all of those others whom you declared righteous by faith in the one who was to come and in our case, the one who already has come. And so through these covenants, help us to understand more and more your desires, your will, your passions, your delights, and then help us align our lives accordingly. This is our prayer in the name of the preeminent one, Jesus Christ. Amen.